Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad, Chapter Four. A month or so afterwards, when Jim, in answer to pointed questions, tried to tell honestly the truth of this experience, he said, speaking of the ship, she went over whatever it was as easy as a snake crawling over a stick. The illustration was good. The questions were aiming at facts, and the official inquiry was being held in the police court of an eastern port. He stood elevated in the witness box, with burning cheeks in a cool, lofty room. The big framework of punkas moved gently to and fro high above his head, and from below many eyes were looking at him out of dark faces, out of white faces, out of red faces, out of faces attentive, spellbound, as if all these people sitting in orderly rows upon narrow benches had been enslaved by the fascination of his voice. It was very loud, it rang, startling in his own ears. It was the only sound audible in the world, for the terribly distinct questions that extorted his answers seemed to shape themselves in anguish and pain within his breast, came to him poignant and silent, like the terrible questioning of one's own conscience. Outside the court the sun blazed. Within was the wind of great punkas that made you shiver, the shame that made you burn, the attentive eyes whose glance stabbed. The face of the presiding magistrate, clean-shaved and impassable, looked at him deadly pale between the red faces of the two nautical assessors. The light of a broad window under the ceiling fell from above on the heads and shoulders of the three men, and they were fiercely distinct in the half-light of the big court-room, where the audience seemed composed of staring shadows. They wanted facts. Facts! They demanded facts from him, as if facts could explain anything. After you had concluded you had collided with something floating awash, say a waterlogged wreck, you were ordered by your captain to go forward and ascertain if there was any damage done. Did you think it likely from the force of the blow? asked the assessor, sitting to the left. He had a thin horseshoe beard, salient cheekbones, and with both elbows on the desk, clasped his rugged hands before his face, looking at Jim with thoughtful blue eyes. The other, a heavy, scornful man, thrown back in his seat, his left arm extended full length, drummed delicately with his fingertips on a blotting pad. In the middle, the magistrate, upright in the roomy armchair, his head inclined slightly on the shoulder, had his arms crossed on his breast, and a few flowers in a glass vase, by the side of his inkstand. "'I did not,' said Jim. "'I was told to call no one, and to make no noise for fear of creating a panic. I thought the precaution reasonable. I took one of the lamps that were hung under the awnings and went forward. After opening the forepeak hatch I heard splashing in there. I lowered the lamp, the whole drift of its lanyard, and saw that the forepeak was more than half full of water already. I knew then there must be a big hole below the water-line. He paused. Yes, said the big assessor, with a dreamy smile at the blotting-pad. His fingers played incessantly, touching the paper without noise. I did not think of danger just then. I might have been a little startled. All this happened in such a quiet way, and so very suddenly. I knew there was no other bulkhead in the ship— but the collision bulkhead separating the forepeak from the forehold. I went back to tell the captain. I came upon the second engineer getting up at the foot of the bridge-ladder. He seemed dazed, and told me he thought his left arm was broken. He had slipped on the top step when getting down while I was forward. He exclaimed, "'My God, that rotten bulkhead'll give way in a minute, and the damn thing will go under us like a lump of lead.' He pushed me away with his right arm, and ran before me up the ladder, shouting as he climbed. His left arm hung by his side. I followed up in time to see the captain rush at him and knock him down flat on his back. He did not strike him again. He stood bending over him and speaking angrily but quite low. I fancy he was asking him why the devil he didn't go and stop the engines instead of making a row about it on deck. I heard him say, "'Get up! Run! Fly!' He swore also. The engineer slid down the starboard ladder and bolted round the skylight 
to the engine-room companion, which was on the port side. He moaned as he ran. He spoke slowly. He remembered swiftly and with extreme vividness. He could have reproduced like an echo the moaning of the engineer for the better information of these men who wanted facts. After his first feeling of revolt, he had come round to the view that only a meticulous precision of statement would bring out the true horror behind the appalling face of things. The facts those men were so eager to know had been visible, tangible, open to the senses, occupying their place in space and time, requiring for their existence a fourteen-hundred-ton steamer and twenty-seven minutes by the watch. They made a hole that had features, shades of expression, a complicated aspect that could be remembered by the eye, and something else besides, something invisible, a directing spirit of perdition that dwelt within like a malevolent soul in a detestable body. He was anxious to make this clear. This had not been a common affair. Everything in it had been of the utmost importance, and, fortunately, he remembered everything. He wanted to go on talking for truth's sake, perhaps for his own sake also. And while his utterance was deliberate, his mind positively flew round and round the serried circle of facts that had surged up all about him and cut him off from the rest of his kind. It was like a creature that, finding itself imprisoned within an enclosure of high stakes, dashes round and round, distracted in the night, trying to find a weak spot, a crevice, a place to scale, some opening through which it may squeeze itself and escape. This awful activity of mind made him hesitate at times in his speech. The captain kept on moving here and there on the bridge. He seemed calm enough. Only he stumbled several times. And once, as I stood speaking to him, he walked right into me as though he had been stone blind. He made no definite answer to what I had to tell. He mumbled to himself. All I heard of it were a few words that sounded like confounded steam and infernal steam, something about steam. I thought he was becoming irrelevant. A question to the point cut short his speech, like a pang of pain, and he felt extremely discouraged and weary. He was coming to that, he was coming to that, and now, checked brutally, he had to answer by yes or no. He answered truthfully by a curt, "'Yes, I did,' and, fair of face, big of frame, with young, gloomy eyes, he held his shoulders upright above the box, while his soul writhed within him. He was made to answer another question so much to the point, and so useless, then waited again. His mouth was tastelessly dry, as though he had been eating dust, then salt and bitter, as after a drink of sea-water. He wiped his damp forehead, passed his tongue over his parched lips, felt a shiver run down his back. The big assessor had dropped his eyelids, and drummed on without a sound, careless and mournful. The eyes of the other above the sunburnt, clasped fingers seemed to glow with kindliness. The magistrate had swayed forward, his pale face hovered near the flowers. Then, dropping sideways over the arm of his chair, he rested his temple in the palm of his hand. The wind of the punkas eddied down on the heads, on the dark-faced natives wound about in voluminous draperies, on the Europeans sitting together very hot and in drill suits that seemed to fit them as close as their skins, and holding their round pith hats on their knees, while gliding along the walls the court peons, buttoned tight in long white coats, flitted rapidly to and fro, running on bare toes, red-sashed, red turban on head, as noiseless as ghosts, and on the alert like so many retrievers. Jim's eyes, wandering in the intervals of his answers, rested upon a white man who sat apart from the others, with his face worn and clouded, but with quiet eyes that glanced straight, interested and clear. Jim answered another question, and was tempted to cry out, "'What's the good of this? What's the good?' He tapped with his foot slightly, bit his lip, and looked away over the heads. He met the eyes of the white man. 
the glance directed at him was not the fascinated stare of the others. It was an act of intelligent volition. Jim, between two questions, forgot himself so far as to find leisure for a thought. This fellow, ran the thought, looks at me as though he could see somebody or something past my shoulder. He had come across that man before, in the street perhaps. He was positive he had never spoken to him. For days, for many days, he had spoken to no one, but had held silent, incoherent, and endless converse with himself, like a prisoner alone in his cell, or like a wayfarer lost in a wilderness. At present he was answering questions that did not matter, though they had a purpose. But he doubted whether he would ever again speak out as long as he lived. The sound of his own truthful statements confirmed his deliberate opinion that speech was of no use to him any longer. That man there seemed to be aware of his hopeless difficulty. Jim looked at him, then turned away resolutely, as after a final parting. And later on, many times, in distant parts of the world, Marlowe showed himself willing to remember Jim, to remember him at length, in detail, and audibly. Perhaps it would be after dinner, on a veranda draped in motionless foliage and crowned with flowers, in the deep dusk speckled by fiery cigar ends. The elongated bulk of each cane chair harbored a silent listener. Now and then a small red glow would move abruptly, and, expanding, light up the fingers of a languid hand, part of a face in profound repose, or flash a crimson gleam into a pair of pensive eyes, overshadowed by a fragment of an unruffled forehead. And with the very first word uttered, Marlowe's body, extended at rest in the seat, would become very still, as though his spirit had winged its way back into the lapse of time, and were speaking through his lips from the past. End of chapter 4